Good evening, everybody. Please take your seats. We'd like to get ready to begin. Erev Tov, good evening, and Baruch Haba. Welcome. Welcome to Temple Road of Shalom. We are very glad to have you here for what I know will be a wonderful evening and a very informative one and an important evening that will help us to better understand and deepen our relationship as American Jews to the state of Israel. As someone who at this very moment is facilitating one of Rabbi Hartman's excellent courses in the I Engage series, in fact, a half an hour ago, I was watching a video of Danielle and taking furious notes for uh, the course I'm teaching, tomorrow, I'm facilitating tomorrow evening. I'm particularly honored to welcome you all to hear from him as well and to begin this evening. I want to thank the Shalom Harbin Institute of North America and the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington for bringing us this program. We at Temple Road of Shalom are excited about the partnership between the Shalom Hartman Institute and Federation and what it's bringing to the DC community, including learning that is at this intersection of connection, change, and leadership. I know we all agree that we as a Jewish people can only rise to the many challenges we face, both in America and in Israel, if we're able to engage each other in new and more helpful ways. So, to start off the evening, I'd like to, and I'm honored, to introduce Gil Pruce, CEO of the Federation of Greater Washington, to introduce Danielle. Thank you, Rabbi, and thank you, everyone, for coming here this evening. I'd also like to welcome Tammy Ben Chaim, who's the Minister of Public Diplomacy of the Israeli Embassy, who's joining us here. My name is Gil Pruce, and I'm the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington. Tonight, it is our honor to hear from Rabbi Danielle Hartman, but I will introduce him more later. The focus of our conversation this evening is on the changing models of the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. I'd like to take one step back, though, before we jump into looking forward. And if everyone could just think about kind of the changing Israel and changing American Jewry in our own lifetimes. So for many people here, Israel was created. It survived the 1948 war. Jews from around the world, including many Arab countries and Europe, came to the land of Israel and the country. 67 war the 73 war, Russian immigration, the Intifada, startup nation, and concerns and beliefs about what is the future of Israel in its relationship with the Palestinians. Over the past 70 years, Israel, I guess 71, Israel went from being an idea to something much more than that in our own lifetimes. In the US, American Jewry has also gone through very significant changes during that time. I'm not gonna go into all of those details, but we are more di diverse than we ever were. We are wealthier. We are more integrated into American society. Um, we are integrated into American institutions. So many institutions that for, for generations and, and generations kept American Jews out, no longer do so. We have seen changes in American institutions, rise of intermarriage, greater inclusion, and significant changes in the nature of American Jewish identity. Across all this, though, the relationship between American Jews and Israel have not really changed that much. There's been some evolution, but at the core, and what we'll talk about tonight, is what is that relationship and where is that going? What should it be? How do we think about it over the next 10, 20, 50, 70 years as Israel and world Jewry continue to change? We know that these are important questions that we will have to face in the road ahead. How do we form authentic, productive relationships? How do we transcend some of the conversation of pro and anti dichotomy of the Israel conversation in which we live today? These are exactly the types of questions that we are seeking to address through our partnership with the Shalom Hartman Institute. We are proud to join with them 
and providing our community with forms such as this to tackle some of our most pressing issues. This partnership underscores our commitment to learn and grow together. We believe that ideas, trust, and understanding will build through conversations and respectful dialogue, and that we will all benefit as a community and as our country. I think you will agree that tonight's lecture is particularly special, both for its topic and our speaker. I can think of no better person to help us grapple with tonight's topic than Rabbi Dr. Danielle Hartman. Dr. Hartman is highly regarded on both sides of the Atlantic and elsewhere around the world for his expertise in Jewish and political thought. He is a master at helping leaders of all stripes to approach complex topics from new perspectives. Thank you, Danielle, for being here. We are grateful for this opportunity to learn from you and look forward to what we're gonna hear this evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hartman. Thank you very, very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I was raised at a time and in a family where to be Jewish entailed first and foremost being part of a people and being part of a family with a deep sense of responsibility to this people and this family. I made Aliyah in 1971, or more accurately, I was taken on Aliyah in 1971 as a 13 year old. There was a family vote beforehand. I don't know, I don't know if any of you have experiences with these family decisions. Well, we had a family decision and I voted obviously to make Aliyah. And about eight months when I was 14, um, after we made Aliyah, I was sitting in class in high school and I was in a modern Orthodox yeshiva high school. Um, very, very intense. We studied every day from 6.30 in the morning was prayer till 8 o'clock at night. And uh, at the time, all the teachers were ultra orth all the Judaic studies teachers were ultra-Orthodox. The religious modern Orthodox community had yet to produce in Israel Talmidei Chachamim scholars and therefore we used ultra-Orthodox teachers. And I remember one day our teacher um, gave us the following lesson. He said to us, students, you're part of the army of God and it's forbidden for you to serve in the army. I was devastated. What do you mean? I had just made Aliyah and the whole sense of I was going to, and in Israel at that time, um, young boys were all looked at. We, we, we had a status because we were the future protectors of the country, which was very exciting for me being four foot ten at the time. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um, and uh, eventually when I, I grew, but when, when I first wore my, my uniform, people didn't know if they were supposed to laugh or cry. It was that, it was quite an interesting experience, but, but in any event. But here, young boy, you're gonna be the future. Coming to Israel, there was this, I was on a Zionist high, and here it was, my teacher said to me, you're not supposed to serve in the army. You're not allowed. And, uh, Eight o'clock when school was over, I took the bus, bus number 18, got home at about a quarter to nine, and I went to my father and I said, Abba, do you know what my teacher taught us today in school? And I shared it with him and he says, come Daniel, I want to teach you a page of Talmud from Tractate Prachot. And I remember to this when I was 14, I remember my father teaching me this following page that I want to share with you. The rabbis ask, what do the words go down mentioned in Exodus mean? Book of Exodus, God says to Moses, 
go down. Go down from Mount Sinai. Does anybody here remember when God said to Moses, go down? Does anybody know what was happening at that time? And go on, try, what was it? The golden calf. The whole Bible was focusing, the whole Bible was working up to this moment when God was going to give the Torah to the Jewish people, and all of a sudden, in some side fieldian do-over, God says, go down. Go down. What do you mean, go down? The whole project of the Bible was about to come to an end. What does it mean, go down? And the rabbis, who were unbelievably astute, careful readers of the Bible, whenever there was an opportunity to take something, to expand on it, to teach a lesson, that's what they did. And they said, what does it mean, go down? And the rabbis put the following words in God's mouth. And this was one of the central lessons on which I was raised as a Jew. The rabbis said, said God said to Moses, go down. I have given you a Torah only for the sake of the people. And now that they have sinned, what need do I have of thee? My father's taught me, he said, Daniel, there is no Judaism without the Jewish people. There is no Judaism without a responsibility to the Jewish people. You want to be a Jew on the mountain? You want to play one-on-one -on -one with God? Somehow, that's what you're interested in? God said to Moses, I don't care about you. You think it's about you? It's not about you. If the people aren't with us, there is no Torah. There is no Judaism. And my father said, Daniel, if you don't serve in the army, in the name of somehow wanting to preserve Torah, you're undermining the foundation on which Torah is given. I made the small mistake of going back to school the next day. <laughs> my father taught me Talmud. He didn't tell me. He taught me. I, my EQ wasn't that developed at the time. <laughs> my IQ was not so great either, but at least I knew Talmud. <laughs> and uh, I had an interesting year. Um, it took me about 10 years to understand that not everything I thought I had to share with people. But that's another lesson. Imagine belonging to a tradition, a religious tradition, which says Torah comes after your commitment to the Jewish people. And that's what it means to be a Jew, is first and foremost to belong to, to be loyal to, to be committed to this people. That's a given. That's the central lens through which I was raised. And when you look at Jewish history, we've walked together. The rabbinic tradition teaches us that every Jew must see themselves as if they came out of Egypt. It doesn't say that every Jew must see themselves as if they stood at Mount Sinai. It's interesting. Jewish tradition says you were at Mount Sinai and therefore you're obligated. But you don't have to see yourself. You have to see yourself as coming out of Egypt. You belong to a people who've been walking together for 3,000 years. That idea inspires me. I have a past, and I've stood by this people, and this people have stood by me throughout our lives. We've literally walked together in the valley of the shadow of death. We've been there. So how is it even conceivable that at the greatest moment in Jewish history, at the most exciting moment, there isn't a single Jew, not one of our ancestors who, would have, who wouldn't have given, forget I'll give my right hand for Jerusalem, to give their right hand to have lived at the moment that we're living today. They couldn't have even imagined it. Jews of power, Jews of success, Two remarkable Jewish communities 
one living with power and success in the midst of our sovereign homeland. We are sovereign, we are free, we are independent in our country. And another major Jewish community living with power and success as a beloved minority. Jews were, we didn't know what, what does it mean a beloved minority? We didn't even know what a beloved minority, now we are a beloved minority accepted and welcomed. We're at home. I don't even use the word diaspora anymore. It doesn't apply to North American Jewry. We're at home. When people speak about intermarriage rates, it's not a symptom of changes in Jewish identity. We live in the first Jewish, in the first community in our history where non-Jews want to marry Jews. <laughs> now think about it for a second. Throughout our history, why would a non-Jew want to marry a Jew? You have to be insane. Why would you want to marry a Jew? You want to check out a pogrom? No, wh no, wh no, what would be your incentive? We are living, it's not just America, we're living in a moment where Christianity, in one of the most remarkable, remarkable testimonies of a tradition, asking itself, who was I and who should I be? has gone through an unbelievable transformation. By and large, giving up on supersessionist ideology. Embracing and respecting and saying, Christianity and Judaism, we are brothers or sisters, we live side by side. Living in a society which looks at Jews in a completely different manner. Of course there's anti-Semitism in America. But every group in America is hated right now. <laughs> And we're not hated more. I'd much rather be a Jew than a Latino. I'd much rather be a Jew than a black. Which group is not marginalized and hated by some people? Anti-Semitism doesn't define the Jewish experience. And there is no evidence to that more than the fact that we are marrying Americans. We are part of American society. It's a remarkable, we, we couldn't even have fantasized. So oh, what the, I'll handle the challenges of being loved over gas chambers any day of the week. I survived Auschwitz, we could survive in America. And here it is, we have this remarkable moment. Two of the most successful Jewish communities in Jewish history. We walk together through the valley of the shadow of death. And now that we reach two promised lands, it's conceivable for people to say, do we still have to walk together? What do I need you for? How important are you to me? Now, I'm not talking to anybody in this room. The mere fact that you showed up, besides <laughs> being evidence of the fact that you're slightly weird. <laughs> you know, you, know, you think about it, how many people are going to show up for a talk on Israel and world Jewry on a Monday night after a snowfall? But, and there's other, but still, there's something. But, but you obviously care. But throughout Israel and North America, we're hearing echoes of a discussion. Hasn't yet happened yet, but it's legitimate to even use the words. What do I need? Am I really connected? Why should I care? Why should I be involved? Why should I be invested in the relationship? I don't want to speak about this federation, but other federations in the country are facing seven-figure donors who are saying, I'll give you a donation on condition that it doesn't go to Israel. I know that money's fungible, but I want to tell you that that's, they're not mine. And in Israel, it's legitimate to say, oh, in one generation, there'll be no, or two generations, there'll be no Jewish community in North America. And somehow that is not something that you should rip Kriya, that you should mourn over. And when we know that when certain words are talked, they shape our consciousness. And so right now, tonight, I want to talk about us. 
I want to talk about the way we understand us. I want to talk about what us means. But first, what I want to do is I want to talk about the different ways that we can conceive of our usness, of our connections. The purpose of doing so is to try to complexify our understanding of what it means to be an us. Number two, I want to focus on some of the notions that we've used to create this sense of Jewish collective identity and to see whether they're adequate. Generals know, and the greatest fear of generals is that they are perfectly prepared for yesterday's war. What happens if educationally and conceptually we're perfectly prepared to deal with the challenges of Jewish identity and collective identity in 1983. If we would now, I feel Jewish community, we're, we're, we're in the zone. We are right there. We're just about 30, 40 years off. And to do so, we have to understand why. What happens when there's certain categories that might be important for us, but they're not, but they mean something different today. And at the end, I want to suggest some ways that we could think about the future. Tonight's talk might not be a feel-good talk. I intended to challenge us. I intended to speak about the fundamental problems that we face, and they're not simple. But I get very excited when we could at least clear out of our radar, false notions, problematic fantasies, and begin an honest conversation. And when you begin an honest conversation, just like in any relationship, it's the basis for a new beginning. Part of my talk is about asking how do we live with each other without necessarily falling into the trap that all couples fall into when they do couples therapy. And that is the purpose of couples therapy is to have the therapist tell my significant other or spouse that they're wrong. <laughs> now, could we get out of that? Could we understand? And how do we think about this together? These are some of my goals this evening. And I hope if I could achieve 30% of them, Dayenu. Let me just put forth a number of categories. When we talk about us, there are five categories, concepts, models that could be used to define this us. Jewish peoplehood is what? Jewish peoplehood could be a family. Jewish peoplehood could be a collection of fellow believers. Jewish people could be a group of partners. Jews could be investors. Or Jews could be consumers. Let me briefly talk about each one. Just define the categories as I intend to use them knowing fully well that the categories are more complex. When we speak about Jewish peoplehood as family, we speak about a group of people related by blood and having a shared sense of belonging and mutual obligation. Family is fundamentally an involuntary relationship. Now, technically, family is not. You, you, could, you, choose, you marry, you can adopt children. But when we speak about Jewish peoplehood as family, we speak about an ethnic relationship, something that you inherit. Now, when we speak about blood, it's imagined blood. We Jews have never been a race. We're not a race. You could marry in, you could convert into. But the notion is once you become part of the family, I am obligated to you in an involuntary way. If you ever, just a, if you ever want to know what Jewish family means, Wear a kippah in American airports. Even more, wear it in European airports. Outside of the airport in Europe, don't wear it. It's dangerous. But inside the airport, it's safe. When you wear it, 
you will experience what is known as the Jewish nod. <laughs> it's interesting, if you, don't, if you haven't experienced it, you have no idea. You'll all of a sudden meet someone who seems to have neck problems. <laughs> the minute eye contact is made, it's subtle. Protocol requires that you respond with. <laughs> so, you don't want to talk, but it's just there's something. I saw you, you saw me, I saw you seeing me. I have your back when the Nazis come. <laughs> like I say, <laughs> in the middle of the airport in Paris, but whatever it might be. It's not, it's an imagined family. It's a choice to have an involuntary relationship with anybody who chooses to be a member of the Jewish people. It's a sense of belonging. And it's a sense of obligation, family. Fellow believers and all the other categories are voluntary categories. Fellow believers, a group of people of a strong commitment either to a shared religious belief or to belief that something is right or good of a value. And to be part of the Jewish people is to be, a, is to be part of a group of people with a mission. Whether that mission is to live a life of value, whether that mission is to live a life of faith, whether that mission is to live a life in accordance with the will of God, or whether that mission is to repair the world or to be a light unto the nations, or it's just to be a mensch. Whatever that mission might be, to be a Jew, to be part of this people, is to collectively believe in the value and content of what Judaism stands for. And I am a collective because of that shared belief. Partners are groups of individuals who join in a common undertaking with shared risks and profits. We're partners together. We accept that this journey we're on is something that I can't do alone. And there's some end. It doesn't have to be a value. It could be just survival, which, by the way, is a value. But what makes a partner a partner is that you're not just in for the profits and the benefits. Partners are also in for the risks and the losses. We incur them together. Exit is not simple. For some people, Jewish people, it is a Jewish people where I'm investing. And part of who we are, what's critical about investors, are participants in a collective enterprise that expend money, capital, or resources. Money, capital, and resources are and have always been an integral part of what it means to belong to this people. I invest, but here the relationship is not symmetrical. Somebody might have more capital and somebody else might need that capital and might deliver something else. But together, we create a community. And more recently, we have people for whom Jewish community is not necessarily a family or it's not even a collective experience. I'm a consumer who purchase or benefits from the use of goods and services. These are the categories that I want to play with today. Family, fellow believer, partner, investor, and consumer. There might be others, but those are the ones that I want to use for this evening. First, family. That's the one that Jews adopted from the moment they began to walk in the world as a community. When God says to Abraham, Lech lecha mi arzecha, mi moladatcha, mi betavicha, leave your country from the place that you were born, your family, God basically says, I'm creating with you a new family. I will make of you a great nation. And that nation is a family. You can either be born, and in the Bible it was patrilineal descent from a Jewish father, later on from a Jewish mother, Someone who converts becomes a Jew. They, Abraham is their father. It's an imagined family, but it is through Abraham. It's a family. You marry, you could also marry in. Intermarriage was allowed in the Bible, as long as it wasn't to the seven Canaanite nations. 
You join, however, what you're joining is a family. It was as a family that we came into Egypt. Our first name as a people is what? How are we called? Do any of you remember? What family term were we called? What is the first name for a Jew? B'nai Yisrael, the children of Jacob. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ethnic family category. The first time we were called a people was by Pharaoh, who calls us in, in Exodus chapter 1, and it's the only time this term is used in the whole Bible, where we are called Am B'nai Yisrael, the people of the children of, of Israel. Because he was basically saying, I know this is where they, it's now there's hundreds of thousands of them. It's an imagined community, but here it is. I'm using this family model. As a family, tribes, we walk through history. It's as a family that we determine that a Jew, even though they sinned, is still a Jew. It's as a family that we say to a convert, the first thing you have to do in order to convert is not to say you love God. The first thing you do as a convert is we ask you, why do you want to join the Jewish people? Don't you know the Jewish people are persecuted and attacked? You're joining a family. You're not joining a faith. It's as a family that we finally, ultimately, emerge from 2,000 years of exile and returned to our home and saw Israel as the homeland of the family. It's as a family here in North America that we built all of our institutions. Assuming that Jews are a family and that they're simply going to belong. Federation is fundamentally a family organization. We are the parents of the family. Give to the Federation and we will, through you, support the family. It was taxation. JCCs, family organizations. Swim with the family. Literally, I was a rabbi. Work out with the family. Hang out with the family. Synagogues, the whole membership model on which much of Jewish life is built, was built on the family model, in which if you move into a community, you're just simply becoming a member. It's like, it's like a family getting together. You're going to join a synagogue. I don't care whether you like the synagogue. I don't care how often you're going to go to the synagogue. No, and it's not, you know, the whole joke about Jews having a synagogue they don't go to. It's my, we even have, me, no, no, it's much more nuanced than that. We have membership in synagogues that we never go to. We might even have multiple, we might have one synagogue where we're a member. And by and large, most of the membership of the synagogue that you care about, you only go to two or three times a year. But you could also, if the community had, a, if there was another synagogue that wasn't doing, you would, you you take out a membership. You just, you you were there for the family. A deep part of the responsibility and relationship to Israel was also, it's just, it's my mishpacha, it's my family. Family created some of the most intense relationships that Jews have, and family created a profound sense of belonging, identity and loyalty. One of the challenges that we're facing in North America is that increasingly Jews, while still being family, are increasingly becoming consumers. People are asking, What's, what do I get from it? Why should I belong? Belonging is not a self-evident instinct. As it is, only 30% of North American Jews have a synagogue membership, for example. If you take out orthodoxy, that's only 20% of North American Jews. And those numbers, that's the, those numbers are, de are, are decreasing on a regular basis. And part of the challenge in the Jewish community is whether the, whether the membership model even works anymore. Why, if I come to synagogue only three times a year, why should I pay membership dues? 
It, am I getting a return? People didn't ask that question. Now, many people bemoan the demise of the family model. But part of what the consumer model is putting in front of us are Jews asking, what are you doing for me? In what way is my belonging meaningful? Family creates intense relationships and commitments, but it also creates relationships where you could take people for granted. You don't pick your family. You pick your friends, assumes that your family is not your friend. And the family are those who you have to suffer a Seder with, or you have to, it's sort of you have to get together around whatever event. Family assumes that I'm connected to you, but just like this, you could turn around and you could find the family relationship. It's kind of atherpy. You could think and assume that it's a given. And part of what the consumer ideology, which is so predominant in North America, is actually challenging the Jewish world to say, well, maybe our institutions have to work harder. The assumption that you're going to have people joining might be an assumption that's creating mediocrity. Consumerism is challenging the Jewish family to say, what are you doing? How do you speak to me? How do you speak to me in a way that sees me, hears me, makes room for me? When you assume that I'm going to be there, the institution doesn't have to compete. Competition is difficult. Consumers, family, there is no exit. You can't leave. But a consumer leaves when there's competition. The minute there's competition, I could leave. Competition is very, very healthy for the Jewish community. But we are in a very difficult moment where we have Jews, some of whom are still predominantly family, with Jews for whom there is some family, but who are beginning to ask consumerist questions. And our institutions are trying to ask themselves, how do we evolve? What do we need to do to speak to Jews who are asking a question that it's not self-evident that I'm going to belong? Take family and consumer. What happens when one generation has a family relationship with Israel? Or what happens when Israel assumes that you're going to have a family relationship with it and you advocate for family, but you don't realize you're speaking to people who increasingly think about their Jewish identity in terms of consumers? You're assuming, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't like the occupation? Okay, you don't, but what difference does that make? What difference does it make if Israel is doing something that you don't agree with? You haven't agreed with things that Israel's been, that I've been doing for decades. Now you're waking up? What do you think the Haredim just now are having, are, have taken over the um, issues of religion and state in Israel? It's been going on since the beginning of the state. But as family, it was just like the uncle that you get together, and I know you don't like them particularly, but you're family, and you walk together with me. This is just an example of a category that defined the Jewish community, still defines some, but is increasingly irrelevant because that's not the way Jews of North America do their Judaism. Why should Jews have a relationship with Israel which is different than the relationship they have with every other Jewish institution? Why should it be different than the relationship that they have with Judaism? They're asking about ideas. They're saying, speak to me. I live in an open marketplace of ideas. I don't need to be Jewish. The whole notion of Jews of choice is a consumerist category. We used to define those who convert or join the Jewish community as Jews by choice. But now what we understand is all Jews are essentially Jews by choice. Every Jew in America is a Jew by choice. There is nobody outside forcing you to be Jewish. You have to choose, and there are other options. You don't even have to choose to leave. There is no, you just don't, you might even have the, you, don't, you just don't use the product. You just don't use it. And it just, you buy another product. You go somewhere else. 
you belong to a different health club. They're not asking me for a building fund. <laughs> and they have more modern equipment. And they're right next to my house or my job or my work. All of a sudden, a different category, Jews by choice, when it comes to this Jewish community, some are looking and saying, what's wrong with you? It's family. But that's not the way more and more Jews in North America are doing their Judaism. How do we talk about Israel differently? And part of what happens is that if you think, oh, the goal then of, of Jewish education is how do we get people to return to the family model? I want to tell you the family model is diminishing in its significance. And it's like Humpty Dumpty. It's not going to be put back together again. I'm not saying it's disappearing, but it's not going to be the fundamental core category through which do Jew, Jews do Jewish in the, in the, in the, at least the perceivable future. And as more and more Jews are in multi-identity families, I would say intermarried, but I don't even think it's a relevant category. Because intermarry assumes that two people with very, very different identities are joining together. That's not what's happening. It's people who share a core American identity who are joining together. They're not intermarrying. They're, we're, we're, we're American. And the more we become part of an American society, the more consumerism is going to be a part of the demands that the Jewish people um, have to deal with. And the, assume, the assumption that there is a necessary, inherited, involuntary relationship is increasingly irrelevant to the way Jews do Jewish. Family and consumer. But there's something even more complicated about the family model. The family model assumes that we're brothers and sisters. The family model assumes that that connection is strong and important, that it is a first order relationship. That family model kept Jews together for 2,000 years of diasporic life. But what happens when family doesn't live in close proximity to each other? What happens when we don't see each other on a regular basis? What happens when we're six to 10,000 miles away? What is family? Oh, you're my brother, you're my sister, I'm so close to you, see you next Thanksgiving. How intense is that relationship? When family is spread over, over such an expansive geography, what is it that's going to keep it going? What's going to keep it as a central defining character, characterization or lens through which you see yourself? One of the things that family defines or demands is loyalty. But in order to actualize that loyalty, you need a sufficient amount of danger. Family actually is a very, we do Shiva well. When you're six to 10,000 miles away, what is it that I, when is it that I'm going to see you? Very often it's during catastrophes, it's during mornings, it's, dur it's, dur it's, 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 it's during a crisis. So for 2,000 years, we had a perpetual flow of crises. We had enough crises to keep the family model meaningful. We didn't necessarily know each other. We didn't speak the same language. We didn't see each other. I know my, my, grand, my ancestors moved to Israel somewhere in the middle of the 18th century. My granddaughters are 14th generation Hartman living in Jerusalem. It's pretty cool. My father and I weren't born there, but this is 14th generation. Go back a long time. And I remember my, anybody who moved to Israel in the middle of the 18th century, these were the people who were dysfunctional, even in terms of Hungarian ghetto Judaism. Like those who couldn't make it in Hungary. Now, not to make it in Hungary. This was like, those are the, fa the, the ones who the family was embar were embarrassed by. Moved to Israel. <laughs> you know, you know we, we need, and they lived in the old city in Jerusalem. And who were they supported by? By, by, by Kaspei Chalukah, by the Jewish community around the world supporting Jews. And as long as there was need, the family is a meaningful category. 
But what happens when we're so successful? We don't have enough, there is not enough anti-Semitism. I'm not going to get into a debate whether there is any anti-Semitism, because for some reason we also are part of a people that hate when someone says there's not enough, there's no anti-Semitism. There's, there's something weird. No, I literally get into trouble because anti-Semitism is not a meaningful part of my Jewish life. And I don't, I don't talk about this. I'm with, when I bring groups to Israel, I don't take them to Yad Vashem to the Holocaust Memorial, because it's not, that's not the central part. It's not what that's, it's, so I, I know I get into trouble. But could we all at least agree that even if there is anti-Semitism, there's not enough to have a meaningful relationship right now. Israel's too successful. Israel's powerful. It's, you can't, you can't be startup nation and pathetic nation at the same time. You can't be startup nation and say, oi, you can't get up and say, I am the most powerful, innovative country in the world and oi, be there for it. It's just not going to be, the family is going to say, I'll just, you know, okay. And you're not suffering. Pittsburgh, I got to tell you, it's just not enough. It's just not enough. And while we're counting every anti-Semitic burp that might be mentioned in any tweet anywhere, and we're, and we're funding institutions to make sure that every Jew knows of each one of them, <laughs> the reality is, let's admit it, in North America, you're the first Jews who invest in real estate. Jews never did real estate. <laughs> we did diamonds. <laughs> Things that you can get. Like, you know what it's like when someone is investing third generation real estate, speaking about the precariousness of Jewish existence in America? There's something kind of bizarre about that conversation. <laughs> the family model works in Israel. But when we say to you, we're family, how meaningful really is that? When Israel's six to 10,000 miles away and for Israelis, you're six to 10,000. We don't even know, we don't even know what to do. So a minister comes from Israel to be with you, to shiva, sit shiva with you. But since he doesn't know you, he doesn't even know what to do or what to say. And what he says or does, he does what's relevant for his family back in Israel. It's not about what's important to you. And it's not that he doesn't mean, of course he means well. But like we always say in family, you know, they mean well in the worst sense of the term. You know, it's like, it's not meaning well. It's just, we don't know what to do when we actually get together. And I was here the day after Pittsburgh. I was speaking the Presidio in San Francisco. Gorgeous place, the Presidio. And as I'm driving up, there is, must be, there was a flag about the size, an American flag about the size of this room. And it was flying at half mast. It's like, I, we weren't alone in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh was not Kristallnacht, ladies and gentlemen. And Pittsburgh's not going to be enough to keep the Jewish people together. So if we don't have enough crises, the family model itself, not only is it not meaningful ever increasing numbers of American Jews, it's not meaningful for a Jewish community, which is so successful by itself. It's there. It might be necessary, but it's not sufficient. And what happens if it gets even more complicated? And this is what Netanyahu didn't understand and was profoundly upset when he came to speak in Congress and to critique the, um, the Iranian deal. He assumed we're family. But who said we're brothers and sisters? Maybe, even if we were brothers and sisters, we're not little children. What happens when you get married? What happens when you have now a spouse? And for many Jews, we have a spouse. It's called America. That's our citizen, that's our country. And just like my parents don't come to my house and critique my wife, it's different. I'm married. When you come to my house, there's rules. How do you behave? Even though we're family, family doesn't live in one home. And we're not children. We get married. We might even be only second or third cousins. So the first thing I want to offer you to think about tonight is how significant is this family model? 
What happens when the central model that defined Jewish peoplehood and usness is a category that just doesn't create the type of bonds and loyalty in the 21st century? You're talking about changes. Just 30, 40 years ago, it was still the defining principle. After the Six Day War, it was a fact we were celebrating in our family together. We were, we, the most meaningful part about the Six Day War is, is what happened before, and we felt that we were on the verge of destruction, and we, we thought it was over. And our family was alive, and our family was free, and our family was strong. Six Day War is when the War of Independence came to an end. That was, it was fair. And now, just 50 years later, it's really only in the last 30 years, that that model is not sufficient anymore. And that means those who care about the future of Israel and world Jewry, our relationship with each other, what happens when institutions and key philanthropists still think in family models to a community which no longer does? or are using a model that's no longer relevant. And then the way to create a relationship between Israel and world Jewry is to convince North America that you're like friends. Think about the future of Jewish life. In order for Jewish peoplehood to be alive, in order to have a strong relationship to Israel, I have to convince you that another Holocaust is imminent. What a pathetic, prescription for the future of Jewish life. This is it. But then we have fellow believers. Fellow believers are people who have a strong commitment to a shared religious belief or a belief that something's right and good. Here too, we have a challenge. And that is for many, many for decades, Israel and world Jewry had two shared beliefs. One, that Israel was necessary for the survival of Jews. That without Israel, without a sovereign state, Jews would not be safe. Or a second belief is that Israel was the place and the opportunity where Jews got to express the best of what Judaism stood for. The best of who we are. That where we are responsible for the public sphere, this is where Jewish values are going to come forth and stand for the best of what Judaism has to offer and the best of what it can offer to the world. And my relationship to Israel was either because it was critical for Jewish survival, that Jews without sovereignty are in perpetual danger, or that Israel could reflect the best of what Judaism was going to stand for. And these two beliefs, together with family, define the relationship. But the consumers are challenging those beliefs. Family doesn't challenge beliefs. Family, of course, we also, not only are we, do we have, do we have a, a myth of shared ancestry, we also have stories we tell about all the wonderful things that we are. We're the most meaningful, we're the funniest, we're the most connected. We are, we are, we are, we are. And a consumer gets up and says, maybe not. A consumer asks, you're telling me that I need you for survival, but where are Jews in danger? My children are more in danger for being a Jew in Israel than your children. Despite 9-11 and despite all the anti-Semitism, it's in Israel that not one single family has zero degree of separation from terror or death. It's my daughter's best friend who was killed in front of a toy store when she was 13. My two children were 10 feet away from a terrorist who was pressing a vest. It malfunctioned. My two children should be dead today. It's my brother-in-law who was killed in a war. I, it was my tank that was blown up and I'm a, I shouldn't be alive today. These aren't experiences that you know. These aren't things. Now this is just every, every Israeli family is a gold star family. Every Israeli, so where is it? You don't live in the, in the field, now again, I feel the pride and dignity of success of Israel, but to claim that, that the only place that Jews could be safe in the world is in Israel or with Israel, 
The fact is the consumers are saying, that's not my experience. I feel safe here. With all the difficulties in anti-Semitism, I feel safe. And the consumers are saying that that's not a meaningful belief. Consumers are asking, Israel, are you really the best of what Judaism could be? I know you're a startup nation, but we have not bad technology here in North America, even in this area. I don't even have to go out to Palo Alto anymore. Is that enough of a reason? Waze? You know, is Waze enough? And so it's just like, you know, Judaism taught ethics to the world. Well, Google bought Waze. <laughs> so, okay, you're like the notion, I, I, that's it. Like this is the, what about value nation? What about some of the issues that I care about? I want to talk about occupation. I want to talk about democracy. I want to talk about Arab rights and minority rights. I want to talk about religion and state in Israel. I have democracy for me as a North American Jew is a Jewish value. I don't know if you are reflecting the best of who we are. I know you declare so, but a consumer says, maybe not. And all of a sudden the shared beliefs are being challenged. And even more significantly, part of the of this, of this, the phenomenon of shared beliefs, were in shared beliefs of us together. There were shared beliefs in which you were invited to believe in the centrality of Israel. Not shared beliefs that we have together. What do, Isra what do Israelis believe about you? You never asked that question. You never asked, hello, you made me share belief, but what do you think about me? You know, the famous Bette Midler line in the movie Beaches where she's talking about herself and talking about herself and talking about herself. And at some moment she says, ah, enough about me. Let's talk about what you think about me. <laughs> well, that, consumers are saying, Israelis, what do you think about me? Stop let's talking about what I think about. What about me? What about the phenomenal innovations that Judaism in North America had brought forth? Of course, Israel has further Jewish life, but so is North America. Judaism today is being produced by two phenomenally successful communities, each one contributing. One contributing from a position of power and sovereignty and the other one by being at the front line of modernity and modern discourse. Pluralism, democracy, rights of people with different sexual identities, the multi-ethnic reality of Jewish life, relationships with other religious communities. These are issues that North America, pluralism, that North American Jewry is innovating and actually importing into his, exporting into Israel. And Israel also, the profound challenges of power and what does it mean to live with diversity. And how do you create a shared society in Jewish culture? Also, Israel is both societies are producing great thinkers. But, but to what extent do I see you? And that's why the Kotel was such a deeply profound, upsetting experience for those who even knew about, those who show up, who actually heard about it. Where, do, do you see me? The consumers are saying, it's not enough. Some North American Jews want to be partners. The most Zionist of North American Jews have decided that even if I'm not family, alone, or I'm not a shared believer, maybe I'll be a partner. But I'll be a partner in building the Israel that I want. And federations are the, sometimes the best models of that partnership. Because they get up and they say, I'm not walking. I don't care. Israel's not a nachas machine. When I'm a partner, I'm not just waiting for the highs. I'm here to build the Israel that we need to build. And I'll be here for every single issue that Israel needs. I'm there. And that partnership is very profound. The only challenge is that Israel never accepted world Jewry as partners. They want you to be investors. And the problem with the partnership is that some partners say, what does Israel need and how do I help it? Other partners say, how do I define what Israel needs? And then the partnership becomes a profoundly paternalistic one. 
where I'm here to help Israel be who it ought to be as I determine what it needs to be. And Israelis are very ambivalent and rightfully so about the partnership because does partnership mean that you get to tell me when my son goes to war? Well, I have to tell you I'm not accepting that any day. Of, no way are you going to tell me when my son's life is going to be in danger. So what is the nature of that partnership? What are the rules of that partnership? We've never talked about it. And Israelis want you to be investors. Just pay money or capital and shh. You get to fund my agenda my game. And consumers are saying, why? Why should I be an investor? What do I get from it? Each one of these categories is challenging us to think differently. I could give the same lecture in Israel and it would be different because Israelis also have to ask themselves, how do they think about you? And part of the challenge we face in Israel is while most of you were raised to think about Israel, most of Israelis were not raised to think about you. They were raised to think about you in terms that are irrelevant to who you are. They were raised to think about you as a dying jury, who their responsibility is to keep the home open and running so that if a day comes that you need to come home, you will always be welcome home. Any Jew under the broadest definition of Jewishness, which in Israel means anybody who would be killed by Hitler for being a Jew. That means you could be converted by any denomination, married to a Jew, have one Jewish grandparent. Israelis feel that you're their family, but they were raised. You have a family that one day you're going to come home. But when you're not home, I don't think about you. I don't. So this is where we are. What do I hope you'll think about and take away from this evening? And with that, I want to conclude and open up for questions. First, not every category that was essential to getting us here is a category that's going to be helpful in the future. It's not about you. Part of understanding even the family model as we all know, is that children grow up. Not to speak of the fact it's not clear who's the parent. But children grow up. And one of the great challenges is how do we adapt the family model to a growing family who aren't necessarily brothers and sisters, have other spouses and significant others, live very separate from each other. You want that family model? I believe that that family model is essential but it's not sufficient. And alone, anything short of a massive increase of anti-Semitism, and for many Jews, that's the only secret to the future of Jewish life. Anything short of that, the family model, which got us here, is not going to take us far in the future. Consumerism. What are the limits of consumerism? Could any identity function on an exclusively consumerist perspective? Super products try to move you from being a consumer to being a believer. That your Apple is not a phone and Nike is not a sneaker. But a consumer of Apple and someone who runs or wears Nike apparel has a whole different ethos and a whole different vision of life. Could some of the most important decisions we make about identity be thought about exclusively in a consumerist perspective? What are the limits of consumerism? Could Judaism and identity, is it really just about going to a supermarket and picking between different ketchups or mayonnaise or mustard? And here you could either be Jewish or Christian or Muslim or, 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 or secular or American. Is it, just, is it just a menu that's all available to you? It's not just an issue of America or issue of Israel, excuse me. What are the challenges and limitations on consumerism? And ask about that and think about that. Is consumerism enough to keep this story? Consumerism has been a great gift to Jewish life. Jews who've been accepting institutions and experiences who never asked themselves, 
What does it mean to live a Jewish life? As the rabbis who stand on this pulpit, unless this congregation is completely different from every other congregation I've visited, the hundreds that I've seen in North America, very often it's not simple to stand on a pulpit. Because many Jews never haven't asked themselves, and they don't even expect. We're trying for you to actually expect something. Bring something to the table. Be a good consumer. I remember I gave a speech once when I was a rabbi of, the J, of a JCC. It was a speech that moved me deeply. <laughs> I was so touched, I can't tell you. I came home and told my wife I was just beyond myself for days. I remember when I, I gave this speech and I, to the JCC, I said, Judaism is not a hobby. Now I wish Judaism would be a hobby. <laughs> I wish we would invest as much in our Judaism as we do in our putt. Imagine if we spent the same amount of money and time and effort in our putt or our serve, a putt, you know, golfing, putt, as we do. I wish we'd be a hobby. Consumerism, become real consumers. What happens when you have a consumer's consciousness, but you're just showing up? We're dying for people who actually have a question. <laughs> We want to teach you a tune, but to teach you a tune, you have to go home and learn it. You're not going to learn it until I want you to sing with me when I'm standing here. I want to sing L'Chadoti, but that means you got to learn the words. And when you use Apple, you know how to use it. You know how to use the phone. You actually, I know, I just got a new, I, I looked on, on, on YouTube. I got all the new things to know exactly all, I know all the secrets of how to use the X, S. I know. I want you to go on YouTube to find out what is the tunes you have to learn. Be real consumers, but, but be consumers in the best sense of the term. But if we're going to move forward, we're not going to be family or just consumers. We have to work very, very hard on being fellow believers. And consumers are telling us that we can't assume those beliefs. Well, great. Well, let's build them. And it's not going to be simple. How do Israelis and North American Jews say, what do we believe in together? To do so, we're going to have to make many leaps and many assumptions. One of the most critical assumptions that we're going to have to understand is that fellow believers could disagree about the solutions and the policies of their beliefs. We could together believe that all human beings are created in the image of God. Together we could believe in the centrality of human rights. Together we could believe in the significance of our aspiration for peace. But good people, smart people, intelligent people might disagree on how best to implement that. Fellow believers might understand that it might actually be very different living in the Middle East than living in North America. It might actually be very, very different trying to implement certain principles in the Middle East. I'm going to tell you, it's very, very hard. It's very, very hard to be a liberal humanist in the Middle East. It is. It's very hard when you feel that somebody wants to kill you. I live every day with the feeling that somebody wants to kill me. It's part of my existential experience. I feel it. Somebody wants me personally dead. Somebody means my children harm. They do. Now, I'm not here engaging in who's worse, Israelis or Palestinians. Palestinians could talk similarly. That's not my goal tonight. I'm not engaging in this question. But when that's what you feel, it's very hard to care about others and to care about their rights. It's not simple. So we could talk about our different experiences. We can learn from each other. It is precisely, and with this I want to conclude, family is not, a, is not sufficient, but it's necessary for us to want to engage in trying to build shared beliefs with each other. You don't need a maximist, maximalist definition. You don't need a, a 10. Two might be enough. to actually care and say, how do I build a shared belief with each other? Family puts you in the room. Consumer challenges you to make, to make that discussion meaningful. 
It's actually family and consumer, those two poles, which are in poles, they could actually meet in shared belief. Now, many of you, and I, all across North America, say, okay, how do I do that? The ultra-Orthodox. How could I build those fellow beliefs? It's never possible. I want to tell you two statistics. 60% of Israelis say we shouldn't take your opinions into account on issues internal to Israeli society. 80% of Israelis say we shouldn't take your opinions into account on issues of security and foreign policy. Front page, this is the headline. Now let me turn it over. 40% of Israelis say that we should take your opinions into account. 40% of Israelis say we should take your opinions into account when it has to do with issues of state, religion, and internal policy. 20%, I wouldn't give zero, 20% say I should talk to you about issues of security. That's insane. But they do. The ultra-Orthodox in Israel are 10%. You now have 40% of Israelis to begin to work with. 40%. Of course, you need it all. That's irrelevant. We don't have the electoral system. We have this coalition. We have small little parties. If you have 10 seats in the Knesset, you rule the country. Well, there's 40% of Israelis who are open to talking to you. Talk. The problem is they don't even, we don't know how to talk. We don't know how to do it. Okay, but now we know what we need to do. We're not going to build by some mythic family. It's just not appropriate for a Jewish life so diverse, so disparate, so spread all over the world. So let's use this small amount of family, those 95% of the Jews in the Pew Suver who say, I'm proud to be Jewish. There's st a feel, there still is a strong, what is that to motivate us to ask each other, how do we walk together and build new shared beliefs? It's that conversation whether it's through federation, whether it's through individual institutions, whether it's through your synagogues, whether it's through the Torah that you talk, and initially you should even talk amongst yourselves. How do we build that shared belief? How do we create a partnership? Not about fixing you, but how do we build a partnership in Jewish life in which families and consumers work together to create a Jewish life of shared beliefs, not about why Israel's important, but about each other, about what each one of us brings to a table, what each one of us has to contribute to a religious tradition which challenges us to be a light. Forget a light unto the nations. That's huge. Just to be a light, to be decent, to be kind, to aspire for excellence in a very imperfect world. Many people are worried about the future of Jewish life. They're worried about the future of our relationship with each other. I'm worried too. But what makes me worried is that we're asking the wrong questions. And more significantly, we're offering the wrong solutions. We're trying to repair and to create Jews in 2019 and 20 in the context of 1980, sometimes even in the context of 1939. Judaism could compete in 2020. Jewish life, we have a lot of meaningful things to do together. Let's ask the right questions. Let's use the right categories. And together, let's be a light. Thank you very, very much. And now, if there's any questions or comments, please. Hi. I think some people have microphones. And First, I'd like to say I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you, sir. It was terrific. Um, what I wanted to comment on is if the future of maintaining a strong identity toward Judaism is in consumerism, I just think that's a very difficult and tall order because companies like Nike and Google and all of them, they spend millions of dollars developing an image, an image that 
they um, hope to cultivate among young people to be a part of, an image that, that young people want to feel an affinity toward. And I think that in our day and age, the old fashioned idea of being part of a Jewish family uh, is challenging in that regard. Great. Um, first of all, thank you very, very much for that question. Now, I share with you um, the challenges of consumerism. I shared them, but it's just, it's part of the reality of Jewish life. And just like Apple would like Samsung to disappear and would like to pretend as if the only one who innovates is them, it's very, we're living in a consumerist society. But I did not say all we are are consumers, we're not. Even the fact that we choose certain models is we're looking for group ideas, we're looking for friends and families and ways to connect beyond just the mere consumerism. Jews stole our family, but the difference is, is that if before I was raised that it starts, that on a scale of one to 10, I'm a 10. I'm not sure that that 10 was helpful. Maybe two is enough. And so number one, we should stop blaming Jews who are twos. It's like blaming my kids for getting older. <laughs> why, do, why are, again, my kids were the best kids when they were little. <laughs> no, it was fantastic. It was just, it was unbelievable. It was such a meaningful experience. It was just great. And we all know you have to have your last child before your first becomes an adolescent because you're not going to have another one afterwards. <laughs> now, all like, what is just, it was, it was great. You listened. But you can't, what am I going to blame you? You, got, you actually got married? You actually, like, I, I'm a Middle Eastern person. I would really love my children to live in my house. For true, I do. The fact that I work long hours makes it easier. But, but, but I would just, I, I would love my children not to live in walking distance, to live on a different floor. We could have different doors. And I don't need a key, but I, I, I but you know. Like, I, I, I don't understand why my children don't come home every Shabbos. I have a son who actually, he actually wants to be with his wife and his baby. I, I, part of me doesn't understand it. It's true, I really don't, because it's, but that's okay, I'm learning. But it's a, that's part, we're, we've grown. And part of the way we've grown is that we have different, ex we have different feelings about the family and we are also consumers. And if he comes home and I'm not nice to his wife or his children, then they're not going to, then family. Consumerism doesn't undermine family. Consumerism might be an integral part of family. Now, of course, it does make, it makes it harder. The question is, we don't need the hatred of others to make our family meaningful, but we just have to work differently. That means we have to stop counting on anti-Semitism to create the self-evidency of Jewish life. We have to stop raising money on anti-Semitism. We're raising fortunes of money on it. We have to stop. Follow the money trail. Stop selling crises. Even though in the short run it returns financial benefits, in the long run it, it, it creates a narrative of the family that people are like, that's what we're about? We're, very often we raise money and in so doing, are creating a narrative of our family that the next generation would never want to be a part of. And so we're building strong foundations with no future. That question would be a worthwhile question to ask. Now take that consumer, forget the superficial consumer. There's also profound meaningful. Let's create meaningful ones. But that means we have to sell a product. We have to improve our product. That means criticism is not an act of disloyalty, but it's actually what every product needs. Because if you don't get feedback, you don't even know how to improve it anymore. Then all you have is your own conversation. Imagine, I was in a conversation today with executive directors, and one of, and, 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 and one of the remarkable women was speaking about how very often she feels blamed by the fact that she's serving communities who are actually asking questions. They're not. In our tradition, criticism is an act of love. Imagine 
If a consumer asks the question, what about the occupation? I'll give you two answers. One is a family model and one is a consumer model. The family model says, shh, don't talk. Don't, don't air our dirty laundry in public. <laughs> shh, don't talk. Now, how, where, where is there a, a non-public? What's non-public today? <laughs> no, just tell me. Like, how, where am I supposed to talk? This is being streamed. Tell me where. Like, what is this private safe? Again, the family, shh, don't, don't tell any, as if there's shh, 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 shh. <laughs> Tomorrow, shh, 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 shh. So first, you, that's one. Second one is, no, you're wrong. The family, your sister, your brother, your parents, we are the most moral people in the world. They're asking you a question. No, you're wrong. You don't answer it, you just simply say you're wrong. What, you don't love your family? And loving your family is the assumption that your family's right. This is, that would be one answer. To a consumer, you'd give a completely different answer. To a consumer, you'd say, I hear you. I also yearn to bring the occupation to an end. I yearn that every Palestinian child should have the dignity of sovereignty that I experience and my children experience. I yearn it for it, not because I want a Jewish majority in the state of Israel. It's not utilitarian. It's because I'm a Kantian, or I'm because I'm a Hillelian, who says what's hateful unto you, do not do unto others. That's the whole Torah. And if I want sovereignty for Jews, I want it for Palestinians too. All people are created in the image of God. I share that with you. And I'm trying to bring it to an end, but right now I don't know how. And I know I'm failing, and I'm profoundly scared about that too. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. But I want to tell you, in the Middle East, it's, it's become really, really difficult. Now, if I, I could go on. Now, if I talk that way, all of a sudden, it's a completely different conversation. And when I talk that way, then they're in the room. We're all learning from each other. I'm not silencing you. I'm not saying, shh, you don't know anything. It's a different universe. And it's harder. But actually, I think we're going to become, we can potentially become much better for it. Um, that's, that's the front line of our conversation right now. Um, I, should, uh, you, deci you decide who you give the microphone to. And uh, if you just raise your hands, there's two microphones here. And, and, and the two of you will, um, they're going to make the decisions. That way, I'm the good person here. Yes, please. I got surprised because I didn't know someone was standing behind me. Um, <laughs> just first, look in the room and see who has their hands up. Yes, please. First, thank you again. Thank um, you, sir. I love hearing you speak. And, and when you're at Otis Israel, I came to see you there. And thank you. Uh, participated in your I Engage uh, program at Otis. And thank you again for being here. Um, thank you. I want to come back to your 40% uh, suggestion. Um, and perhaps toss back to you a, a challenge to, to give us some guidance. Um, and, and in doing that, uh, you know, I choose the 40 percent because that will keep us away from the, the issues raised by the 20 percent, keeping us away from the security issues, the occupation issues, and so forth, and focus more on the, the internal issues. Um, you know, I look around the room and I, I see a lot of people like myself who either have no hair or gray hair or white hair, but those of us in that category um, probably remember a period in our own history here, uh, back in the Vietnam era, when people were throwing rocks and stones in the street at those of us who were demonstrating, uh, being told, America, love it or leave it, or my country, right or wrong. and. You know, those of us who are on the other side of that issue were saying, no, that's, it's not my country, right or wrong. We had a, a, a point of view here, and um, uh, th there were no institutions working in our own country that left us any choice but to take our views to the street. And if that was our viewpoint in our own country, if we loved our own country enough to say the answer was not my country right or wrong. I can't see myself turning around and saying, oh, but in Israel, it's my country right or wrong, 6,000 miles away. 
And the frustration and despair that I feel right now as a gay Jew in America whose family, maternal grand, great grandfather, doesn't go back as far as yours, but ran from Russia to Jerusalem in the 1880s, is we don't have any Jewish institutions in this country who seem to be willing to engage on behalf of the vast majority of American Jewry to talk to that 40%. We have no functioning institutions who are willing to have the courage to step up on behalf of the 80% of American Jews who feel this way. What do we do? Thank you, and I feel your pain, but I would tell you you're not alone. I would tell you, and again, it's not just because I partner with them. Your federation hears you. Your synagogues hear you. Your denominations hear you. But your experience, I can't say, your experience is, is profound because we might, we're doing the wrong job then in making you feel heard. But I could tell you, I work with rabbis, executive directors, heads of Jewish institutions all across North America. And I want to tell you, you're not alone. But if you haven't heard it, we have to do a better job. Because you shouldn't be alone. You shouldn't be. Because part of what family is about, loyalty in family, it's not just about being there when you're dying. It's about actually you feeling that somebody's hearing your voice. You're not a member of a family if you're, if you're silenced. And I want to tell you, you're not. And part of our job is, to, when I talk about these things, is to create an awareness and to also, again, you've just, the head of federation is here. And I know him. I could vouch for him. I could be a character witness. No, and I do. I know you're a rabbi. You're not alone. Now we have to do better, a better job of making sure that you experience it. And if we haven't, that's a terrible failure of our community. And many, many Jews feel that. Many Jews do. But there's this profound dissonance. I remember Michael Beinart, Peter Beinart, wrote this very famous article about how the, there's a whole voice there's a disempowered voice in the Jewish community. And the great paradox is that, that his article was read by every Jew. So he, well, who's, who's being silenced? <laughs> he was speaking about, but that was his experience. Now, part of the challenge is that when you experience a family community, you think that the, it's, it's shh. And maybe unintentionally we're saying too often shh even though we don't intend to do so. Maybe too often we think we have to speak silently in back channels, and some of our voices aren't brought forward. Maybe we have to learn how to talk differently, to do the things that we care about. Because at the end of the day, you're one of the best that we have. You came all the way from out of Israel to here. <laughs> you know, you're here. And if you feel disempowered, imagine how children, next gen, how, what they're feeling. And so part of these categories that I'm mentioning are to give us a language to talk about the feelings that many Jews have and to begin repairing them and to somehow begin to overcome some of the flaws, unintentional, that are creeping into our discourse because there is no future unless we repair and answer, those, answer your challenge. You got me. I'm there. <laughs> you know, I'm there. I march. I march, I teach, I'm fighting for the Israel that, that, that your voice has a place in. And uh, inshallah, you know, we'll get closer. Um, My initial reaction was sign me up. But I have to kind of do a little overlay on what you talked about in terms of the consumer model and the family model, because I think for those of us in the boomer generation, the family model is what we identify with, but the Gen Xers, and I, I realize I'm generalizing, 
I think that that's more the consumer model. And the question then becomes the millennials and the post-millennials. I think that they're more, much more like we are in terms of wanting to repair the world and wanting to be a light. I agree with you about that. The real question is, how do we engage a generation that communicates in tweets? And how do we develop those deep relationships that are necessary to achieve the kind of relationship that you made me cry, that that's the kind of relationship I want to build, too? Right. Um, well, first of all, I belong to the generation that doesn't even understand those categories. <laughs> like, you know, there's too many categories. I'm like, I don't even know. It's like, it's just too many. So I'm one of the, I'm such an anachronism. But with you, um, we don't know. None of us know exactly how to do that. And that's a very healthy beginning. It's when we think that we know that we're coming up with the wrong answers. I want you to know nobody, nobody knows how to create the conversation that we need in the future. Nobody. But that means, but I know, I know what won't work. You know, as I was speaking again to the executive directors, we have to start, the beginning of wisdom starts with Socrates. Because Socrates was the, was the wisest man because he was the only one who knew that he didn't know. It's at these moments that we have to be Socrates. We have to start almost afresh. Part of our partnership, Armin is, we're not coming here. Armin is, we're not filled with answers. Sometimes we get criticized that we have too many questions. Thank you. Part of thank you. There is something Socratic about breaking down the assumptions. And when you break it down, we have a fantastic community. We have unlimited resources. We have phenomenal talent. Phenomenal. Now let's begin. To, once we've gotten rid of what's not working, we could begin experimenting with what can work. Start a new conversation. My hope, I believe, and everything in my career and in 40 years that I've been doing this job, is that when you speak value, when you speak challenges, when you speak about Judaism as a way of life that could be meaningful and inspiring, Jews hear and Jews come. I believe that in, the, that in the battle for ideas, we can claim a place. How to do so? We're going to try lots of things. For some, it's going to be ideas. For others, it's going to be different types of institutions. And let's learn from it. But let's not lock into silly, stupid solutions, these, these silver bullets. You know, and again, I, there's one of my favorite lines. I went, I'm going to go from Beth Midler to um, Goldie Hawn um, in Private Benjamin. And again, that late, that just you should know, when you talk about Private Benjamin, there's a whole generation of one of those who you quoted who has no idea what, you're, what I'm talking about. But Private Benjamin, at the end of the movie, when she refused to sue back, she said, anytime somebody promises you the world for 10 cents, Chances are you're getting something that's not worth a dime. Anytime, it's a great line. We are creating 10 cent solutions for the future of Jewish life. Let's get serious. Let's get serious. This is a tradition that shaped history. Jews, we were never the most powerful. We were never the, the largest and most significant or wealthiest. We shaped world history as small little pishy people. There's 14 and a half million of us. Chinese, by the way, are convinced that there's 300 million. <laughs> I don't need to disabuse them. There's 14 and a half, that's it. Little pishy people who have lived in the sewer pits of history for the last 2,000 years. We shaped, we, we, we had a disproportionate impact. And that impact was because we stood for something. We stood for something. And we were people of value. And we were people of ideas. And we were people of principles. So the leap of faith that you and I have to make is that same content could prevail again. But it has to be challenged. We have to ask, what are those values? We have to question them. We have to clean out the crap. And we have crap. We have to clean up our failures. But at the end, my leap of faith is not in the inevitability of our success, but in the value of what we stand for, and that that value can um, inspire. Um, 
I apologize. I see there's many, many hands, and we ran out of time. And uh, I don't mean disrespect. I, I speak too long, so I apologize for that. But I see that your hands. I won't leave um, until every one of you who had a question um, has a chance to come speak to me about it. And I want to tell you, it was really an honor and a privilege to be with you this evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jen Raskis, and I'm the Washington, D.C. manager for the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. I just want to thank Danielle Hartman for this incredibly thought-provoking and important conversation. Uh, thank Gil and the entire team at the Federation for their visionary leadership and partnership, the clergy, um, and Cookie Mandel, uh, coordinator extraordinaire from Temple Road F. Shalom. And really all of you for being here and by taking part in this conversation, really bringing light to our entire community. We want to welcome everyone right now to a dessert reception that is sponsored by the Israel Committee of Temple Rodef Shalom. Please make a right turn uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much. Oh, fantastic. So I'm so looking forward to it. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.